starting your own company is very similar to meeting the woman of your dreams and getting married. When you, when you grow your business, you go through a lot of the same stages that when you go in a relationship. And it starts out very uh, beautiful, it's all about passion, and it's very intense, it's exciting, everything is perfect. And then after a while, you may run into a couple of difficulties here and there. And then after more time, there may be more difficulties. And then years go by, and before you know it, you may end up like, like this couple here, like this old couple. And that is the same story for a lot of companies. When they grow and get bigger over time, they turn into these kind of companies. I call them zombie companies. They're very boring places. There's no more passion. It's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of hierarchies. People don't really like to work there anymore. I started my first company 12 years ago. And ever since then, I've been talking to a lot of entrepreneurs about this topic. I find it very fascinating. Why does that happen? Why do companies turn into these zombies? I would say about 90% of all companies end up that way. And what's even more interesting is the question, the other 10% of the companies that do not end up that way, what do they do differently? What is their secret? There's some examples. Facebook, I would say, is a good example. They are nine years old now. They're about 5,000 people. And I'd say their culture is still pretty cool. It's, it's very innovative, it's creative, and it's fun to work there. Here's another example. This is a company from London, Innocent Drinks. They make these smoothie drinks. They've been around since 2004. And even despite being acquired by Coca-Cola, they still have a very cool company culture. Here are some photos from my own company, GameDuel. We've been around now for almost 10 years. We're based in, in Germany. We also have an office in San Francisco. And we've gone through all the stages, starting with three people, and five people, 10 people, 100 people, and now we're 200 people in our team. And every stage had its own challenges. But one thing we made, and in addition to building games, we have 70 games, uh, mainly on our own platform, but also on Facebook and on mobile. But one thing we made, in addition to games, was also building our culture. We made sure that from early on we work on our culture to keep it uh, a good place to work. And I talk a lot to other entrepreneurs about this and ask them what, what their story is, what their secrets are to keep the, the workplace vibrant and, and cool. So today I want to share with you the four keys which I believe are important to have if you want to grow your company but keep it a good place. The first key is about high performer people. This is about getting the right people, a lot of the right people. I'm talking about people like this. So people that are very highly motivated, self-reliant. You don't have to manage them much. They, they are self-driven people, very experienced often. And they bring a lot of value to, to the team. Why is it important to have a lot of these people in your, in your team? Well, Netflix. This is another company. They have a pretty cool culture. They all, although they are over 2,000 people, and they have a document, uh, it's kind of like their cultural Bible, their internal book about their company culture and values and processes, and they explain it very nicely in there, the importance of high performers. They say, as your company grows bigger over time, um, the complexity of the business increases as well. We all know that. But the complexity increases over proportionally, actually. So you have more people, you have more games, you have more projects at the same time. You may even have studios in different locations or time zones. So it gets very complex. Companies hire people. Pretty much they hire some junior people, some senior people. So the average percentage of, of high performers of the team doesn't really increase much over time. And that leads to the situation where, at some point, the complexity of, of your business is just outgrowing what the team can handle. What companies do then in response is not to hire more high performers, but they introduce a lot of 
regulations and structure and hierarchy and processes to, so that an average team can handle this complexity. That, on, that leads, of course, to exactly this type of culture that's boring and kills creativity. And the worst part about it is it drives out your high performer people because these people don't like to work in this kind of environment. It's a downward spiral. What can you do about that? Well, you can make sure that from early on you hire enough of high performer people. Netflix say that you should actually overproportionally hire high performers as the complexity of your business increases. That's the only way you can avoid to introduce a lot of processes and, and the only way to, to keep the culture really good. That's the first key. What's the second key? The second key is about freedom. It's about giving your team a lot of responsibility and freedom and the way they work. There's a lot of research on that and one of my favorite books on the subject of motivation is Drive by Daniel, uh, Daniel Pink. Who of you has read Drive? Anybody has read the book? Okay. So in this book he talks about what motivates people, especially in the creative industries, what drives us. And one of the things he says is autonomy. People want to have freedom and autonomy in their work. If you ask the best people in your team what drives them, what makes you get up in the morning and say, okay, today I'm going to go to the office. It's going to be an amazing day. I'm really going to make it great. What, what is that? When I ask people on my team, a lot of people say, yeah, it's when I have a big challenge and I get the responsibility and I get the freedom to, to s choose how I do it, how I tackle it, I can experiment, I get some time, and I can even make some mistakes, but eventually I get there and that's really motivating for me. So freedom is a big motivator, especially for high performer people. Netflix, they have a very elegant approach to this, which they call rapid recovery. Instead of introducing a lot of regulations and, and structure, they say, you don't need to have a big book with all the rules in it. You can, they have, there's only one rule. Act in the best interest of the company. That's the rule. And with that rule, you'll cover 90% of the cases. And yes, there will be 10% of the cases where people screw up and they make mistakes, but in our industry, these mistakes are not huge, usually. The cost of making those mistakes and then afterwards fixing them is much lower than the cost of having huge rules and regulations for every corner case and that cost that it has on the, on the company culture. There's other industries where it's different. If you're a doctor, you want to make sure that you follow certain procedures and regulations rigidly. That makes sense. But in the creative industries, Rapid recovery is a, is a better approach. Freedom also means to question things, how you work. We've been working like in certain ways for 100 years or more. Why still do that? Maybe it's not appropriate anymore. So question things, simple things. You can, we had one developer who said, I, I want to have more screens so I can work more productively. And we said, okay, how many screens do you want? Two or three? He said, five. And well, now he has five screens and he works much more productively. Why not? That's just a small example. You can question a lot of things like uh, working times, even vacation. There are some companies that have a no vacation policy, act in the best interest of the company. That's all you need. Spotify, they questioned the way they structure their teams. So they created a very agile uh, work environment and there's a interesting document on that. You can Google it, Scaling Agile at Spotify, where they talk about how they restructure the teams in tribes, they call it, and guilds. It's very small and, and impactful teams. And we have a similar approach at our company for about three years, which works very well. We have very small and agile teams, and they get a lot of freedom. In fact, um, I, I believe that the smaller the team, the bigger the performance of the team. Okay, freedom, that's, that's the second key. What's the third key? That is about personal growth of your team. It's another one of those big ones where people really want personal growth to be motivated. Um, and uh, Dan Pink calls it mastery, to grow and learn 
especially high performers, they, they want to evolve and move on and learn something. And if you don't offer that to your team, they will go somewhere else to another company and do it there. So it's a very important tool also for retention of, of your employees. And we really underestimated the importance of that in the beginning. We said, you know, why invest so much into the team? We'd rather spend the money on marketing. Uh, and why does Google have the 10% the time? What, the, what is that all about? Well, it's about giving people the opportunity to grow and learn. And the best way to learn, of course, is to learn from great colleagues. If you have great, some of the best artists and some of the best game designers and some of the best developers and you work in this environment, then you can learn a lot from, from those colleagues. And we have been working on creating a culture of collaborative learning in our company where people share a lot of their knowledge and experience. And we have a lot of these kind of events. We call them communities of practice where in the morning there's, there's free breakfast and people meet and then people from different teams share their knowledge with, with the rest. So for example, somebody from the marketing team might talk about user acquisition on Android or on, on Facebook and somebody from the product team talks about the new prototyping tools and somebody from the data analysts talk about uh, how to do A-B testing or how to work with Excel spreadsheets and make pivot tables and things like that. Very interesting communities of practice. We also get a lot of external experts into our team to coach the company, to coach the team. So people from the open source community talk about the latest technologies and frameworks. And here this is Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, and he gave a talk about cloud computing. Typically, we invite these people in as uh, speakers, but they also do, before that, they do an internal coaching, internal workshop, and then we have a public speech. And there we invite other companies as well to listen in. And that turned out to be a very good recruiting tool because people come for the talk. We have these tech talks on a regular basis, but then they see our, our company, they see our culture, and sometimes they then apply for a job afterwards. Personal growth can even go beyond learning. It can even be about giving people opportunities to change career paths within your organization. We had one developer, for example, who was one of our best Flash developers. And one day he came to me and said, you know, Michael, I, I've been developing for a long time, but I think I don't want to code anymore. I, I'd rather work in the product team and become a game designer. You know, I've never done it before, but I think I might be very good at it. Well, we, we gave it a try, and it turned out that that guy is an amazing game designer, and now he's uh, one of our best uh, product owners and been with the company for seven years. That's the importance of personal growth. The fourth key is passion, because passion is what gets lost a lot when companies get bigger, and you have this kind of attitude where people don't really care anymore about the customers, they don't care about their teammates, they don't care about the company much. People say, yeah, that's the way it is when companies get bigger. I think it doesn't have to be that way. And there are some examples. Take um, Zappos as an example. They're over 2,000 people. They're an e-commerce company, and they're famous for their amazing passion for the customer. They're, they have this amazing team culture, and they even have other companies visit them in their Las Vegas office and taking tours and to learn how they do this, how they, how they have this fantastic uh, culture and passion. That's a very, very good example. They also have a website where they show a lot of videos about their, their culture and values. Here's a quote from one of my favorite authors, Robin Sharma, and he says, the more successful you and your organization become, the more humble and devoted to your customers you need to be. I think this is, this is very true. And if you think about the way bigger companies usually treat their customers, it's, this is not going to cut it for you. This is not about passion. This is our team, our community and customer insights team. We have a special team for that whose job is it to go out and talk to the customer on a daily basis on the phone. They also do live events where they invite customers and they bring in the stories and the information uh, and the passion from the customers into our organization. Why not have a wall of love where you share these stories with your team? There's nice stories. We had one, one story with uh, two people were playing 
uh, a multiplayer cop game. They didn't know each other. They were from different cities. And they started chatting in the game a little bit. They got to know each other. They decided to meet offline. They liked each other, apparently. And they met more and fell in love. And then they married, and they sent us this photo. They got married. It's a beautiful story. Um, another one is this guy. This is Werner, uh, Walter, Walter. He's um, 93 years old. He's Germany's oldest online gamer. He didn't even know how to use a laptop. His wife taught him how to, how to use it and log in. And now he's playing um, one of our card games with, with his friends online. Bring these, bring these stories back because it's about passion. We're, we're in the games industry, but I think we're, we're not just making games. We're really we're making smiles. We're making emotions. That's, that's the business we're in. So these, these are the four keys. And there's actually one additional ingredient. If you add that to the puzzle, one, it's like the secret sauce that amplifies everything and makes it work even better. And that secret sauce is to add a strong team culture. Because also team culture is something that gets lost when, when companies grow bigger in size and they start to create these walls internally and they have these compartments and departments and there's a lot of politics going on and people you know, do a lot of uh, useless activities within the company. So you have to actively work against that to prevent that happening. And there's little things you can do. We have, for example, it's very easy. We have every Wednesday, we have cross-team lunch. That's where we take people from the different teams, like from finance, from marketing, and mix them randomly together, and they go to lunch so they can talk to each other. Works very well. Even the design of the office can have a big impact on your, on your culture. In our old office, we had three floors, and you had to take the stairway to go from one to the other. Of course, people, they never did that. They'd rather send a quick email, and that killed the personal communication. So when we moved to the new office, we made sure, you know, we tore down all the walls. We dug a hole right in the middle of the room and put the stairway right in the middle of the room. So now it's very easy to go from one floor. There's only two floors now. And that has had a tremendous impact on the team culture and the communication. There's a, a great book also uh, about team culture, uh, tribal leadership. Because the most important thing is, is um, the attitude of the people you get. And in this book, um, Dave Logan analyzes what team culture has uh, an impact on the different performance of, of teams. And it turns out that on a consistent basis, teams with a very strong we culture, with a very collaborative culture, outperform other team cultures, especially the ones that are much more based on individuals and superstars and people with big egos, like these people. These are the people you don't want to have on your team because they can destroy an organization like that. I've seen it happen in, in many organizations. They may be high performers. They may be really good, but they come at a high price. So we're very careful to get these people, to not get these people into our team. And we have very rigorous recruiting processes where everybody interviews the new people and then they can veto. There's a story uh, I'd like to share at the end about team culture. It's, we, ha we had one project, a game we were developing. There were five people working on that team, and the game had to launch for Christmas, so the deadline was quite tight. We told the team, OK, you have to make that deadline. How, what can we do? So you really make it. You go the extra mile. And we thought, well, maybe give them a little bonus, a little cash bonus. The team thought about it for a while. And they, they came back and said, you know what? We don't, we don't want the money. We don't think it's a good idea. Because just the five on us are on that team. What about the rest of the company? That's not fair, really. Why don't we get something for everybody? And so we decided getting a pool wheeler table if the team makes a deadline. And as soon as we announced that, the whole company, it changed. Like everybody was cheering up behind that team. It's like, oh, how's it going? How can we support you? Created an amazing dynamic. And for sure, we made the deadline. And here's a photo from, from our lounge. And that table is like a daily reminder for us of, of the impact a great team culture can have on a whole organization. So here are the five principles. And I believe if companies follow those, those principles, you can grow in size and, and get older and keep it a, a great place to work. You don't have to end up like that old couple. And in fact, those principles also do apply to personal relationships, to your marriage. You can try it out. There's 
my last slide is going to show you a couple that has tried that out for, for quite a while now. And here's, the, here's that couple. Okay, thank you very much. There's actually one, um, there's a website we've created, insidegamedeville.com, where you can find some more information about our company, our, our team culture, about our values. You can see a video from our office. I invite you to check that out. And also, please send me an email if you have your own success stories. I'd, I'd really like to get in touch and, and talk to you about, <coughs> about it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <coughs> That's a pretty am amazing amount of thought you've given to this topic. Any questions for Michael? Hi, Michael. Um, my question is, um, we, our company started out small. We were five. We're about 30 now, but uh, we're very tight on budget. And my, one of my biggest struggles is trying to find creative ways um, to maintain a company culture on a very tight budget. Um, a lot of the stuff that you've shown um, talks about the, the office environment, doing things like, for example, uh, the free breakfast or a regular lunch. Uh, sometimes that's, even that is out of budget um, for us. So what are some things that you can recommend for um, a very tight budget um, company to maintain a company culture? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Of course, um, as you grow your, your company bigger, you have more budget available to do events like that. But I remember when we were smaller, we also did uh, these things. Then um, even people paid for themselves in the beginning, but still went to, to the team lunch and had a lot of fun. So I think there's creative ways you can do this. And if you have the people with the right attitude in your team, they will find ways. If you give them time to think about it and time to, sp to spend with each other, there is ways to do it always. And even decorating the office in a, in a, or just putting the tables in a different way. We have one team that put the tables in a circle now where they sit like, uh, back to back, and they just turn around, and that instead of having it this way, and that changed the the team vibe uh, tremendously. <laughs> Little things you can do. Other questions for Michael? Um, and the other question I have is again um, financial related. Um, you mentioned about hiring top performers. Yeah. Um, it's same thing. What happens when uh, you reach a point where you need to hire more, but you don't have the budget that a high performer might be asking for, and you can mm -hmm. only afford someone who is not uh, a top performer? Um, because yeah. that's what's happened with us. We have I have a core set of top performers, but mm -hmm. the rest of the team, I'm struggling to keep motivated, to keep them uh, at the same level, and we're having to introduce a lot of processes that I don't yeah. want to. Um, but we can bring in more high performers because they ask for a lot more. Well, the question is rather, can you afford not to hire the top performers? There are some top performers that will only come for a certain salary, but there's also some top performers that come because they believe in, in your cause and the passion. And uh, yes, you, have, you pay more, but in my experience over the, all these years is that it pays off. And you may hire one person that um, has an impact of five people, and you really have to think it through and see what they can uh, eventually bring in terms of impact. You may save, you don't need to grow your team that large um, by having really high performer people on your team. They can find creative ways and, and they will to, to leverage uh, that. And it pays off, in my experience, always to get these people. I have a quick question. So what are your thoughts as far as the positive and negative impacts of a distributed workforce versus a centralized one? Yeah, I have. Some experience with that, we had um, worked with people in different locations, and it, it's possible. I've seen it in other companies where it works, but it's certainly much more, makes it much more difficult. And I know some companies that say, no, we're not, never going to do that. We have one location. It's just much, so much better for the team culture. We now have that approach. We have a very small office in San Francisco, but all the production teams, they're all in one place. Um, and I'd say it makes it much more easier. It's, if you go the other way, you can have very strong studios in different locations, and then you make sure you have a very good culture in each of those. But across the organization, especially distributed, where people just work remotely, it makes it very difficult. I, I haven't seen many examples yet where this works really well. Awesome. Thank you very much.